Ciao. <laughs> well, that exhausts my Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Katharina. It is a singular honor to be here. My wife and I thank all those who have made our visit possible. In my talk, I explore the idea of animal rights, beginning with the prologue from my book, Empty Cages, Facing the Challenge of Animal Rights. What? I can now hear the translation. Just a moment. Okay, let's fix it. Okay. You can go on. You can go on. I can go on. Uh, so, the cat. Several years ago, the Home and Box Office Network aired a program entitled To Love or Kill Man versus animals. It told a fascinating and at the same time a disturbing story about how different cultures treat the same animals differently. One especially chilling segment took viewers out to dinner in a small Chinese village. You know how in some restaurants patrons get to choose from among live lobsters? And how after they make their selection the animal is killed? And the chef... I don't hear the translation, okay? You can go on. I can go on. Please. How after the animal is uh, make the, the animal is killed, the chef cooks the same a meal of their choice. At this Chinese restaurant, things are the same, except the menu is different. At this restaurant, patrons get to select from among live cats and live dogs. The video takes its time. First we see the hungry patrons inspect the cats and dogs jam sheep by jowl into wooden cages. Next we see them talk it over. Then we see them make their selection. Finally, we see a man yank a white fluffy cat from her cage and hurry into the kitchen. While the cat claws and screeches, the cook hits her several times with an iron bar. Clawing and screeching more now, she is abruptly submerged in a tub of scalding water for about 10 seconds. Once removed and while still alive, the cook skins her from head to tail in one swift pull. He, he then throws the traumatized animal into a large stone vat where, as the camera zooms in, we watch her gulp slowly with increasing difficulty her eyes glazed until her last breath taken she drowns the whole episode from selection to final breath takes several minutes when the meal is served, the, the diners eat heartily, offering thanks and praise to the cook. I've never been more stunned in my life 
I was literally speechless. Like most Americans, I already knew that some people in China, Korea, and other countries eat cat and eat dog. The video didn't teach me any new facts about dietary customs. What was new for me, what pushed me back in my chair, was well, seeing how this is done, seeing the process, watching the awful shock and suffering of the cat was devastating. I felt a mix of disbelief and anger welling up in my chest. I wanted to scream, useless as this would have been. Stop it! What are you doing? Stop it! Now, I don't think that my response to what happened to the cat is any different than anybody here. Because I think we all share a common core of compassion. And that we will all want to oppose what was being done to the cat. We all want to help the cat. We'd all want to stop it. Unless it seemed like this is a xenophobic view of mine that I'm singling out Koreans and Chinese for special censure. Let me, let me hasten to add that increasingly more and more Chinese and Koreans are voicing their opposition to the custom of eating cats and dogs and they want to help cats and dogs and they want to stop this custom in their countries. Well, I'm an animal rights advocate and proud of it. And you might think of us as people who generalize on a cat episode. It, it's, it's not just what's happening to cats and dogs. It's what's happening to other animals. And we stand in opposition to it. We want to help the animals and we want to stop their exploitation. Animal rights adv advocates are not reformers. It's not that we want to continue to exploit animals and make it somehow more humane. We are abolitionists. We won't be satisfied until these practices are abolished. And so animal rights advocates, you might think of us as saying, we don't want larger cages, we want empty cages. Now you have to wonder, how did we get this way? You have to wonder, how did we get this way? Maybe 1% of the world's population embraces animal rights. Well, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all answer to this question. I think there are at least three different explanations. And the first is what I call the Da Vincians after Leonardo. And of course we all know his great works of art. But what's less well known about Leonardo is that he was an animal rights advocate. He didn't use those words back when he lived. But he lived the life of an animal rights advocate. 
at a very early age, he, when he understood what meat was, where it came from, that an animal had to be killed, he refused to eat it. And he went further. He wouldn't eat eggs. He wouldn't drink milk. He wouldn't eat cheese. He was a vegan. And he, when he would go into the marketplace, he would pay the vendors who had birds in cages and set them free. So some people are animal rights advocates because they're Da Vincians. They have this natural empathy and compassion. It's not something they're taught. It's not based on some proof. It's not figured out. It's just the way they are. Then there are the Damascans, what I call the Damascans. And this is based on the biblical story about Saul on the road to Damascus. And if you recall, Saul is going to Damascus to arrest followers of Jesus. What? You can go on. Okay. To arrest followers of Jesus and bring them back to face trial and possible execution. So as Saul was on the road to Damascus, the heavens open up and the, a voice is heard, a great illumination, and a voice is heard. And this is after Jesus had been crucified. And it's the voice of Jesus demanding, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecute me? So on the basis of this one experience, Saul, one of the principal detractors of Jesus becomes Paul, one of the principal apostles of Jesus. So Damascans, who are animal rights advocates, have this transforming experience. It's not something that you're taught. It's not something that's based on proof. It happens to them. Not something they figure out. And I'll give you just one example. This was from a man I met in Germany who was 10 years old during the Second World War. And of course, there were air raids and people went to the air raid shelters. And after a particularly heavy bombardment, this young boy, Hans was his name, came out of the air raid shelter and turned and walked down the street. And he heard a clippity-clop, clippity-clop of a horse, horse's hooves on the cobblestone street. And the horse was on fire from the tip of his nose to the tip of his tail. Apparently gasoline had spilled over the horse and had somehow been ignited. And the horse ran directly at Hans. And just before he collided, he veered off. 
But as he veered off, he looked Hans in his eye. And it was as if Hans said, the horse said to him, what have I done to deserve this? Why aren't you helping me? And from that point on, Hans was a different person. He had a change of perception. It was as if all his life, all he could ever see was the vase. And then in the blink of the eye, he could see the faces. A change of perception, profound and far-reaching. It was as if he was a new person in a new world. Instead of seeing other animals as something to be turned into food, Damascus see them as sociable creatures. Instead of seeing them as something to be turned into clothes, Damascus see them as models of stoicism. Instead of seeing them as something to be entertain us, Damascus see them as wise in the ways of the world. Instead of seeing them as something to vanquish, Damascus can see them as families to be protected. And instead of seeing them as something to turn into tools and laboratories, Damascus see them as exemplars of intelligence. Damascus have a change of perception in the blink of an eye, a change that extends to all sentient beings. Then there are those I call muddlers. And muddlers, as the name suggests, just muddle alone. They have no natural sympathy. Nothing transforming happens in their life. They want proof. Animal rights is something they have to figure out. How do they figure it out? Well, they have to learn what's happening to animals. And they have to explore ideas. Learning what's happening to animals. The veal crate. Most veal calves come from male calves born to dairy herds. Since these calves are not going to give milk, the farmer looks for a different product. That's where pale or premium veal comes in. It's the flesh of calves who have lived in stalls too narrow for them to turn around in. For the whole of their life, they are fed a liquid diet deficient in iron, an anemic diet, anemic in iron to ensure their pale flesh. And for what, a muddler asks, so the diners can eat pale veal. Learning what's happening to animals, dolphins in captivity. Dolphins in the wild are amazing creatures. They, they live 
active in social groups, often going back several generations. Mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, grandmoms and granddads, cousins. Left at sea, they can swim 40 miles an hour. And they can, they can dive to 400 feet. Throughout the world, they are imprisoned in cells. Even in the best circumstances, even in the sea worlds of the world, they are denied the expression of their true nature. They are prisoners. And for what? So that people can find a source of entertainment. Learning what's happening to animals, the Dray test, named after its inventor. A, a small amount of test substance is injected into an animal's eye, usually an albino rabbit. It's left untreated without anesthetic for up to 14 days. Lab scientists check for redness, swelling, discharge, ulceration, cloudiness, blindness. And for what? So that Consumers can purchase safe cosmetics when in fact there have been safe cosmetics not tested on animals for decades upon decades upon decades. Learning what's happening to animals. Mulesen, so named after an Australian sheep rancher. Looking for a place to plant their eggs deposit them in the folds of merino sheep. In less than a day, the eggs hatch and the larva look for the nearest source of nourishment, which happens to be the sheep. The sheep can literally be killed in a matter of days. And a mule sing using a sharp knife, like a razor. And without the, without the benefit of anesthetic, ranchers cut deep swaths of skin from the crouch area of the sheep. One observer describes the sheep scuttling sideways like crabs trying to escape the pain. And for what? So that people can wear stylish merino sweaters or coats, learning what's happening to animal slaughter. Not to tens of billions of animals slaughtered for food, but the annual slaughter of hundreds of thousands of harp seals in the Northwest Atlantic. You've seen this picture, or one like it, black clad hunters bludgeoning defenseless harp seals to death. A blind test is required. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, a blink test is required. Hit the eyes of the seal. If the seal blinks, the seal is alive. If the seal doesn't blink, the seal is dead. Independent observers 
have testified that the blink test is not monitored. It's up to the hunter. So hundreds of thousands of seals are slaughtered annually. And for what? Not for their meat, but for their pelts, so the men can have skin pel belts and so mugglers must find out what's happening to animals but mugglers also must explore ideas and Amongst, see, amongst the ideas they must explore, or do animals have rights? And also, what difference does it make? So we turn to the question, do animals have rights? And we, this we know, we cannot find reliable answers to this question in the media. We cannot find reliable answers in opinion polls. We cannot find reliable answers in unexamined traditions. Only by thinking independently can we hope to find reliable answers. Which brings me to the invitation of philosophy. Philosophy is invitation is to think for ourselves using logic being, being factually informed and freeing ourselves from prejudice the purpose of my remarks is to extend philosophy's invitation I turn then first to the role of human rights rights protect our most important values they are there to protect our life they're there to protect our body they're there to protect our liberty rights limit freedom your rights limit my freedom I am not at liberty to injure your body without justifiable cause I am not at liberty to deny you your freedom without justifiable cause and I am not at liberty to take your life without justifiable cause so your rights limit my freedom but my rights limit your freedom as well it's as if they are invisible no trespassing signs stop do not enter this body is already taken rights are equal my rights are no greater than yours and your rights are no greater than mine rights take priority they take precedence over other matters of value 
they are what we can refer to as the Trump suit in the game of Maryland. Here's an example of a Trump game. This is a hand in bridge. Someone plays the Queen of Spades. Someone plays the King of Spades. Someone plays the Ace of Spades. I'm, I'm the last player. I have no spades. But I do have a two of diamonds. And if diamonds are trump, my two of diamond beats the queen of spades. It beats the king of spades. It even beats the ace of spades. That's how powerful the trump suit is in the game of risk. So we take uh, other important values. So we take the, the more, one more. We take uh, uh, the, the uh, what is it? I can't quite see it. So social custom. I'm sorry. We, yes, in general, we ought to promote the customs of our society. We take, we take personal benefit. Yes, we ought to be in concern about advancing our, our personal life. We, we, we take the public good. Yes, we ought to do what promotes the public good, the, the social welfare, the general welfare. But not at the price of violating the rights of the individual. So, rights are equal, rights limit freedom, rights protect our life, liberty, our body. They are the Trump suit in the game of morality. So we asked, do animals have rights? And what we're asking is, are they protected? Do they, are, are, are they in the same moral category as we are? Well, do animals have rights? They're going to be factual questions. More. More. There we go. Okay. So they're going to be factual questions. When these questions ask what is the case, and they're going to be foundational questions. And the foundational questions who has rights and why? And the main factual questions, are any animals like us physically? Are any animals like us mentally? So we ask physically, are there any other animals who have sense organs like we do? Are there any other animals who have a central nervous system like we do? Are there any other animals who have a brain like we do? And the answer is yes. Uh, certainly, uh, mammals and birds are like us in those respects. Others, fish perhaps. Are any other animals like us mentally? And it's possible to say no. It's possible to say they have no sensations. They have no desires, no emotions, no beliefs. This is Descartes' view. 
where Descartes argues that animals are biological automata. They're like wind up biological toys. And part of the reason, one of the reasons he gives is they, they have no mental life because they lack a soul. They're not immortal. And I think that Voltaire's reply to Descartes is entirely adequate. Voltaire says, are we to assume that animals have the physical basis of having a mental life so that they might not experience anything, so they might not be aware of anything? And Voltaire says, do not uh, attribute such an impertinent contradiction in nature. Well, are any other animals like us mentally? Well, it's possible to hold the position that they're nominal in terms of sensations. But they have no desires, no emotions, no beliefs. This is the position of the American philosopher R.G. Fry. Fry argues that yes, animals experience pain and pleasure. But they lack beliefs and desires. Because they cannot use language. Well, an obvious reply to Fry. Who is unmarried and a bachelor, by, by the way. Is, is, is that young children can't use language. Therefore, using the logic of Fry, young children have no beliefs and desires. Only a bachelor could believe this. No, notice then, if, 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 if we can't make this argument on Fry's basis against children having beliefs and desires, then logic requires that we not use the same reasoning in the case of other animals. All right, then the, the possibility is that the mental life of other animals is robust. It's brimming with sensations and desires and emotions and beliefs. And this is a view that's supported by common sense. It's supported by our best science. And it's supported by our religious traditions. Common sense. Everyone understands. The dog wants out. The dolphin remembers. That hurts the chimp. But not only common sense, our best science. And what I, what I mean in particular is evolutionary biology, Darwin. Darwin says the minds of mammals and birds differs in degree and not in kind from our mind, our mental life. Yes, we can read physics and history. 
Yes, our, our memory through our culture stretches back centuries. But that mammals and birds, these animals, have a robust mental life with desires and beliefs and emotions and sensations. All that is supported by biology. Our religious traditions. No religion teaches Descartes. No religion teaches R.G. Fry. All religions. All religions teach that animals have a robust mental life. In a word, animals are subjects of a life. They are aware of the world, aware of what happens to them, and what happens to them matters to them because it makes a difference to the duration and quality of their life. So that is in part the factual questions that muddlers have to explore. The main foundational questions. Who has rights? Why? But there are many possible answers. I can't possibly cover them all. But among the most important ones are all and only those who are morally responsible. All of us are morally responsible. On this, on this sort of foundational view, we have rights. But it can be argued that other animals are not morally responsible. And therefore, they don't have rights. But this way of thinking conveniently overlooks the fact that many humans are not morally responsible. A newborn baby is not morally responsible. A child of one year old age is not morally responsible. The mentally enfeebled of all any age are not morally responsible. Do we, we therefore say, we are free to maim their body, we are free to take their life, we are free to deny them their liberty? And of course the answer is no. But, if that's true in the case of humans who are not morally responsible, then animals cannot be denied rights because they are not morally responsible. You have to be self-aware to, to have rights. It's not merely that you're aware of the world and aware of what happens to you. You have, you have to be aware that you're somebody in the world. You have to be, yourself has to be an object of your awareness. And so the argument is, all of us are self-aware, all of us have rights, but no non-human animal is self-aware, which is why none have rights. Well, I don't agree. I think the animals that I'm talking about are self-aware. 
They can act intentionally. And what that means is they initiate an action now with the expectation that they will receive a, a result in the future. But for whom are they trying to get the result? except for themselves. So any animal who can act intentionally is self-aware. Who has rice? Well, all know only those who have immortal souls. We all have immortal souls. No non-human animal has an immortal soul. Therefore, we all have rights, and none of them do. This commits a fallacy of irrelevance. Who has an immortal soul makes a difference. What happens after you die? If you have an immortal soul, you go on living. If you, if you don't have one, you don't. But what happens after you die has no bearing on what's true of you while you're alive. Here's a possibility. All and only those who are subjects of a life have rights. We all have rights. But so do the other animals. Because they are just as much subjects of a life as we are. Oh, there will be objections to this idea. They'll, the people will say, they don't have rights. They will object. They don't have rights because they don't respect our rights. But we don't require reciprocity when it comes to which humans have rights. We don't require young children to respect our rights before we recognize rights in their case. They don't understand rights. We do, we do. That's why we have rights and they don't. But again, this overlooks billions of, millions of human beings who don't understand rights. And we do not say of them, therefore, that they lack rights. They are under our dominion. That's why we have rights and they do. We are, not, we are not in the same moral category as, as they are. But this dominion idea is a religious idea. And if we think about the story in Genesis about God giving us dominion, we have to think back and, and address this in a religious way. Think back to what was the original state in the Garden of Eden. And what did Adam and Eve wear? Did they wear fur? Did they wear leather? No. I think they were modest and they used leaves. What did they eat? Did they eat pork? Did they eat steak? Did they eat lamb? No. Did they eat eggs? Did they eat cheese? Did they drink milk? No. No. Uh, and they were vegans in the Garden of Eden. 
And so, uh, in a religious sense, to respond and give respect to this answer, what we say is either we continue to disappoint God, or we try to journey back to Eden. In one way, not the only way, we tried to journey back to Eden. Is to practice the diet and the clothing that God chose for us. So we come to the issue what difference does it make whether animals have rights or not? Well, think about what we said before. We have social custom, we have personal benefit, we have the public good, and we have respect for the rights of individuals. And what it means, the difference it makes, if animals have rights, is that we should respect their rights regardless of social custom, regardless of personal benefit, regardless of the social good. And this applies to the food we eat, the clothes we wear, how we learn, what we do for fun. So we return to our question, do animals have rights? We cannot find the answers in the media or in opinion polls or in unexamined traditions. Do animals have rights only by thinking independently? Can we find an answer we can live with? Which brings us back to the invitation of philosophy. Philosophy's invitation is to think for ourselves using logic, being factually informed, freeing ourselves from prejudice. The purpose of my remarks is to extend philosophy's invitation. Thank you.